Okay, so this video is about alternate forms of, the, of um, induction. So different ways that we can think about induction. And in particular, we're going to be thinking about induction as saying something about subsets of the natural numbers. So let's recall that there's a correspondence. between the following things. So between predicates on the natural numbers, which is of course what we've been talking about when we're talking about um, induction, and subsets of the natural numbers. So this goes as follows. So if we have a predicate that we're interested in and we want to um, produce from that a subset, then we can just say, okay, let's consider the subset of all the natural numbers um, that satisfy our predicate. And this is, of course, a subset of n. And to go the other way, we can say, okay, let's consider a subset of n. How do we get a predicate? Well, we can get a predicate from a subset by just saying that the predicate is the statement and is in the subset, okay? And these two um, assignments, this one going forward and this one going backward, are actually inverses of each other. They actually form a, um, a bijection between predicates on n and subsets of n. So they are telling us that predicates on n and subsets of n are just two sides of the same coin. They're just two ways to think about the same thing. So we can reformulate um, induction as follows. And we're going to reformulate it in terms of subsets, not in terms of predicates as we have been talking about it. So we can um, we formulate it in the following way, and we can still call it the principle of induction because it's really the same thing. It's just a different um, viewpoint on the same thing. So now let's consider not a predicate as we have before, but a subset. So let's consider a subset S of N. Okay. So we're going to do um, some things. Hopefully I'm going to leave enough space here. And our goal will be to prove that S equals N, okay? This is analogous to the goal before when we're talking about predicates where we tried to prove that P of N was true for all N. Now, thinking about this in terms of subsets, that corresponds to saying that our subset S is the whole of N, that S contains every natural number, okay? So to prove this using it, this form of induction, we're um, first going to prove that zero is an element of n. Okay, so this of course corresponds to the first part of what we have been talking about as induction before, which is where we uh, have to prove that p of zero holds. So here we're going to prove that zero is an n, not that p of zero holds, or sorry, zero is an s, not that p of zero holds, because we're thinking about subsets, not predicates anymore. And now we are going to say if n is an s, then I'm gonna leave some space here for a reason. Then n plus one is an S, and this should be true for any n and n. So if we can say these two things, and we can somehow prove these two things, then we can say that S is an n, right? And this should, I mean, this is just, as I said, um, a different way to think about induction, but it should also make sense on its own. If zero is an S, and if we know for any one guy in S that if that guy is an S and the next guy is an S, then we can, of course, say that all the natural numbers are an S because number one tells us that zero is an S, number two tells us that then one is an S, and then two tells us again that then two is an S, and then two tells us that again then three is an S, and then four is an S, and five is an S, et cetera, et cetera. So if we know one and two, then we can say that S uh, contains every natural number, and so in particular, it's equal to n, since we're supposing that it's a subset of n to begin with. And uh, so I, I wrote here complete induction. So what I've just described is just the analog of regular induction, 
But to give the analog of complete induction, we would rather say um, not that n is an s, but that m is an s for every m less than or equal to n, then n plus 1 is an s. So in parentheses here, we have this stronger um, complete induction principle. OK, so let's uh, look at an example that um, corresponds to one of the examples we saw of just regular induction. Now we're just going to talk about it in terms of subsets, not predicates. So we're going to let s be the following subset of n. So it's all those natural numbers such that n or n plus 1 is even. We want to prove, so before we um, wrote this as a predicate and we proved that the predicate was true for all natural numbers, so now we want to prove that this um, subset S contains all natural numbers. So it's just the, the analog. So for the base case, so again, we could call it the base case, but we're going to try to prove that zero is an S. So we need to show that zero is an S. And of course, there's the kind of the starting point version of all of this, but we're not going to consider that um, in this lecture. So uh, we know that zero is even, of course. So zero or one is even, and thus zero is an S by the definition of S. So the base case is easy just as it was before. And for the inductive step, uh, the inductive step, we are going to assume that n is an s, and we want to show that n plus 1 is an s. So uh, let's say maybe not if, but since since n is an s, then by the definition of s, this means that n is even, or n plus one is even, and maybe I won't write the rest of this proof because it's exactly the same as um, as the first example that we gave in the basics of induction lecture. So we could say. Therefore, n plus 1 or n plus 1 plus 1 is even. So there's a lot of reasoning missing here, but we already talked about that. So when we do that reasoning, then we can say, therefore, n plus 1 or n plus 1 plus 1 is even. So n plus 1 is an s by the definition of s. And then we can say, therefore, by the principle of induction, since 0 is an s, and whenever s, n is an s, then n plus 1 is an s, we find that s actually contains all natural numbers. So in particular, it is n. OK, so now let's talk about the least element principle, which is um, pretty important, pretty useful whenever you're talking about the natural numbers. So let's consider, well, let's say what this says is that if we consider some non-empty subset of n, so it's very important that this is not empty, then S has a least element. And this should hopefully make intuitive sense to you. Any subset of the natural number should have um, one unique least element. Okay, So it should not be true for the real numbers, right? And think of all the real numbers that are strictly greater than 1. They don't have, um, that doesn't have a least element. But any subset of the natural numbers, since the natural numbers are somehow kind of spaced farther apart, they're kind of discrete. Um, then any any subset S of the real numbers has a least element, as long as it has at least one element. Okay, 
So let's talk about a proof of this. So this proof is maybe um, a bit more advanced than the other proofs we've seen in this course. And I want to give this proof because first of all, um, it does use induction. So it's a good example for a proof by induction. But also this proof, I think this is the first one we've seen in the course that um, where, where and I'm giving you a proof, not just um, as an example of problems that we can see, but the proof I'm giving you as an explanation of why this is true. So I'm giving it to you as kind of a teaching tool, as an explanation, a good explanation as to why this fact is true. And um, so I just want to point that out because that's one of the most important reasons why we're interested in proofs. Of course, proofs should prove things beyond a reasonable doubt, but also proofs are how uh, largely how mathematicians communicate with each other. They um, are largely how we uh, explain how parts of mathematics works. Okay. So in this proof, I'm trying to explain to you why the least element principle works. So we're going to start out this proof by saying suppose not. And now again, um, we're using proof by contradiction, just like we use the least element, uh, the law of excluded middle, sorry, uh, in the last lecture or the lecture before. So we're using something that we haven't quite talked about um, extensively in the uh, logic section of the course, but hopefully um, it will be clear what's going on. So we're going to suppose that this statement, the least element principle, does not hold that it's false, that not the last element principle holds. And then we're going to arrive at a contradiction. And so then we're going to be able to conclude using proof by contradiction that the least element principle does hold. OK, so when we do something like that, we often start out the proof with the phrase suppose not. So suppose that the least element principle doesn't hold. Then for every element little s of s, what I want to say is that s is not the least element of s. So how to really draw that out explicitly is to say that what that means is that there is some element r in s such that r is less than s. Okay, So for every element in s, there's some other guy um, smaller than it. So for every guy in s, uh, that guy is not the least element of s. So now we're going to consider the complement s. And our goal is to show that it is the whole of n. By induction. Okay, so we're going to use this um, hypothesis that the least element principle doesn't hold to show that the complement of s is the whole of n, which of course then means that s itself would be empty. But we're supposing that S is not empty. So that's the contradiction that's going to happen. OK, so for the base case, we have to show that 0 is in this complement. And what this means, we know from what we talked about before, that 0 is not in s itself. So if 0 is in the complement of s, that means that 0 is not in s. Okay. So if 0 were in s, so now we're doing um, negation introduction. So if 0 were in s, then 0, we can just say, would be the least element of s, right? Because there's certainly no natural number less than, than 0. So 0 would just be the least element of s. There's nothing that could be smaller than 0. So since we assume that s has no least element, this cannot hold. So 0 cannot be an S, or in other words, 0 is in the complement of S. OK, now let's 
look at the inductive step. So for the inductive step, we're going to use complete induction. We want to assume that M is in the complement of S for all M less than or equal to N. And we want to show that N plus one is in the complement of S. In other words, that n plus 1 is not an S. Okay, so again, we're going to use negation introduction. So we're going to suppose that n plus 1 is an S. Then since we know that m is not an S, for all m, well, what we have here is that m is less than or equal to n, but we know that another way to write that is that m is strictly less than n plus 1. And we know that, or we're at least supposing at the moment, that n plus 1 is an s. Then we can say from these two facts that for all um, m less than n plus 1, m is not an s, but n plus 1 is an s. That means that n plus 1 is the least element of s. Okay, that means that since n plus 1 is in there, but nothing less than n plus 1 is in there, of course, n plus 1 then has to be the smallest thing that's in there. Okay, so then we have that, I mean, since we're supposing Let's write that out actually. So since we are, we are, or say, since we're supposing that S has no least element, we find that N plus one is not in S or in other words, that n plus 1 is in the complement of s. So we can say now that we've completed the, the two steps that we need for complete induction, and we can just sum up and say, therefore, by the principle of complete induction, we've demonstrated that the complement of S equals N. And now I'm realizing actually, um, I wanna say here, it's not strictly necessary, but it's a bit nice to the reader to say that we're using complete induction at the beginning so that they can more easily follow um, what's going on. All right, so then since, uh, so we're not done, I mean, that we have kind of a proof of induction, a proof by induction, sorry, proof by induction, um, that is most of this proof, but it's not the whole proof. We're just using the proof by induction um, to get what we really want. So what that is, what that's gonna be is that, okay, so since the complement of S is N, that means that S is empty, right? So if the complement of S is everything, then nothing can be an S. But S is non-empty. That was one of our hypotheses in the, in the very beginning in the, in the statement of the thing that we're trying to prove. And so we can just say, this is a contradiction. Okay, so we've um, supposed, we've supposed that the thing we're trying to prove is false. Then we reached a contradiction. So in natural reduction, we would say that we've proven false. So let me say what's going on here. So let me try to draw an arrow here. So this is the beginning of, up here is the beginning of the proof by contradiction. And this is the very end of the proof by contradiction. So what we're using here is proof by contradiction. And it's not necessary 
now not totally necessary to sum it up, but I always like to sum up these proofs, make it really clear to the reader what's going on. So we can say, therefore, using proof by contradiction, we find that the statement, we can write out the least element principle if we want, but we can just say the statement holds. So the statement, the phrase, the statement just stands for that whole statement that we're trying to prove. So we suppose that the statement didn't hold in the beginning. Then we showed there was a contradiction. To do that, we used this um, alternate way of looking at the principle of complete induction. And therefore, after all of that, we were able to conclude um, that our statement, the least element principle, does hold. Okay, so we found now, we've proven that in fact, any non-empty subset of the natural numbers has a least element like we hopefully expected.